ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Julia Baird is back on Conversations today. Julia is an author, a journalist. She's been a columnist for the Sydney Morning Herald, the New York Times, and she wrote a best-selling biography of Queen Victoria. Over the last few years, though, Julia's had to spend a lot of time in hospital, enduring several bouts of major surgery. But amidst all that awful pain and terror and indignity, Julia has experienced moments of grace, acts of kindness, generosity and courage, acts of moral beauty. Often these moments of grace are small and seemingly undramatic, but they can affect you profoundly. They stay in the memory. These moments are all the more precious because we don't exactly live in a time where there's a lot of grace to go around. It's a time of growing loneliness, of poisonous public debate and bitter self-righteousness. Julia says that grace is like the sun. It warms us, it fuels us, and unerringly brings light. And if you turn to face it, it puts the shadows of the world behind you. Julia's new book is called Bright Shining, How Grace Changes Everything. Welcome back, Julia. Such a pleasure to be back. Grace, it's not a word that's used very often outside of religion. How would you like to define the beautifully ineffable thing that is grace, Julia? Well, the thing is the ineffability and the mystery is a big part of it. I mean, a lot of people, when I ask about what they think grace is, they talk about its absence. We kind of know what it's not. Writers and thinkers all the way through history have said it is something that illuminates, something that transcends, something that goes beyond the ordinary. I think I ended up deciding that it was about a remarkable goodness, a remarkable decency that was beyond the quid pro quo, that wasn't eye for an eye, that was about loving the unlovable, forgiving the unforgivable, mercy, not merit. Something that really strikes you when you see it. And the thing is it can be so mysterious and so confronting in its beauty but it also can be very much every day. And I also ended up adding a third part of that, the definition to it, which is about living in a way in the natural world. I think you can live in a state of grace if you are fully comprehending that none of us have done anything whatsoever to live amongst the marvels that unfold around us every day in the natural world. And it's our responsibility to to look after it. You say one of the most fundamental things about grace is that it's undeserved. Yes. We are all flawed. We all make mistakes. And if we really, if everyone really got their just desserts, (laughs) (laughs) and sometimes they should, right? Mercy, you know, like fortune does not always favour the good, does it? If everyone got their just desserts, it might be a very satisfying world. (laughs) It'd be like a Victorian boy's... Uh, private school, I think. You just get flogged every morning for stuff you were about to do rather than stuff you don't <laughs> Yeah, want that's done. right. The sheer anticipation <laughs> and thought of it all. Um, I think that fundamentally it, it, it is has to be you're doing something because there's a human need. Let's talk about like blood donation. I spent a lot of time with blood donors when I was writing this book and I was really struck by what they're doing is not because they've met someone who they really like who might need something from them. They literally are every two weeks it usually is getting a bus, getting themselves to a local donation centre, sure, having a bicky, maybe a cup of tea or a milkshake when they're there, having needles stuck in their arm, a bunch of intrusive questions, getting drained of blood because there is someone in the world who is in pain who might need it, to walk, to live, to go on another day. And they're not stopping and going, I wonder who that person voted for in the uh, last election or I wonder if they take their bins out regularly or stick their garbage in the neighbour's bin like I do sometimes, which is nice. (laughs) Shame. Okay, it's all coming out here now. Here it is. Okay. Naked confessions here from She never has much in her bin Um, (laughs) anyway. But um, so... And the quick, so they don't stop. And I think that there's something so powerful in that. 
And, and, and you spoke at the beginning about me spending time in hospitals and so on, and you notice the nurses, the staff, the surgeons, the, the, the care that is there because there is a person who has a need. You don't walk into a hospital and they say, oh, it looks like you've got a uh, broken leg there, mate. Um, might need to be amputated. But the thing is, what kind of parent were you? What kind of sibling were you? What kind of child? Anything. Whatever metric you consider to be what a good person is, they will take you in and they will fix you. And I've seen nurses be yelled at, be abused, be threatened and have them still come back and look after that same person the next day. And I am fundamentally amazed by that. There are two wonderful quotes in the early part of your book about what grace might be. And one is from Helen Garner, and I'm just going to quote it here. Helen Garner, who wrote, happiness is not a tranquil sunlit realm at the top of the ladder you've spent your whole life hauling yourself up. It's more like the thing that Christians call grace. You can't earn it. You can't strive for it. It's not a reward for virtue. Mm. It's something you glimpse in the corner of your eye until one day you're up to your neck in it. Mm. My word, she's a wise woman, isn't she? <laughs> yes, exactly. And I thought that was that was exactly right. You can't demand it or you can't force it. And I also think a lot of people think about grace as either something women have always told to be, obedient, sweet, nice, suck it up, invisibly take on all like abuse and horrible things that are done to you and just continue to spin out, I don't know, cakes and lovely ditties. It's not that. It's not poise. It's not poise, exactly. And it's not being complicit with bad things. And I think that's a really important point to make. It's not about skipping through sunlit meadows, through the daisies, or just getting baked to nice cakes by a nice gran who lives down the street. Not that I would ever underemphasise the importance of that because I love nice cakes from nice grands. It can be extremely difficult. There's a grit to it and it can come out of horror and it can come out of oppression and you can see people behave in ways of just immense resilience, uh, endurance and grace through times when you think they should just be giving up on it all. And and I think that grit's really important to remember when we think about like the Abdullah family whose children were out getting an ice cream, three of their kids and a cousin and a guy who was intoxicated in some way killed them, ran over them and killed them. And they decided to forgive in a way that as the world witnessed it made no sense reporter wrote in The Guardian the day after that, it was like the world caught its breath and were like, we don't entirely understand what we're seeing, but uh, but we also understand there's a certain beauty in what they've decided to do. And Danny Abdullah will say, it's not like you just make that decision once. Sometimes you might wake up in the morning and you're hit with the grief all over again and the horror of it. And yet you decide to go on, yet you're deciding that's how you should live. And I need to say as well, it doesn't mean an absence of consequences and an absence of justice. It's not letting people off the hook. It's sometimes letting yourself off the hook from what they have done to you. There's another quote about what grace is from another author, Marilyn Robinson. Grace, she says, is an understanding of the wholeness of a situation. And it includes the fact that we live in an unfathomably interesting universe. This is 100% true, Julia. Yeah. She's written better on grace than almost anyone, I think, Marilyn Robinson. The wholeness of a situation, I really think, anytime I'm really struggling with a person and something they've done, I have to sit down and think through what their motivations are, what they've been through. Sometimes people, you just need to sever it. Fine. It's poisonous. Sometimes you need to think about the, their own fears, their anxieties, what they've been through, what they're trying to do, and really it's the only way to kind of move through, I think. If we cannot fundamentally accept each other's frailties, we will never know what we can forgive and when we can't. I was really interested to come across a study about those that gave people the benefit of the doubt and there were a bunch of scenarios like you walking along the street and you see someone you've known for a while and you go to say hi and they just walk straight past you. How do you think about that? That person's a jerk, they're a snob, they're... Maybe they didn't see you. Maybe they've just had terrible news. You've been waiting for a really important meeting and then you turn up and on the day 
and you go to the office and they say, oh, sorry, they've taken the, the day off, will you then go, oh, well, I guess it, something important or will you say they don't care about me, that's completely rude and obnoxious and which it is. So you do make a decision sometimes about how you think about other people and how you choose to have that anger. Anger sometimes is an important emotion. I've talked before about women being taught to soak things up. And I think that is a bit gendered, that we're, we're often taught to internalise, blame ourselves, get sad instead of getting angry in a way that is like this is enough and this has got to stop. You've seen too much of the inside of a hospital over the last few years. Yes. Weirdly enough, hospitals, they're, they're not pleasant places at all to be in. They're mm. utilitarian. They might have a nice view out the window, but the inside's never very oh, no. very pleasant at all no. to be in and you're often in a great deal of bits. pain and, you, yes, it's not good. No. Nonetheless, these seem to be places where you can experience extraordinary acts of grace. I remember a woman after my last surgery and I, it was nil by mouth, like nothing, and I was so parched. Did I still have a tube down my mouth? I can't remember. I had tubes coming out of everywhere. I was in the ICU and I was just desperate, I, desperate, desperate, desperate. I always want old-fashioned lemonade, like the American-style lemonade that you sell on street corners when I'm really <laughs> coming out of surgery, and I wasn't allowed any. And then one day she was like, OK, I'll give you one ice chip. I was like, oh, my gosh. And I knew that she probably shouldn't have and it was like the greatest ice chip and one of the best moments that I've had. But there are so many moments like that. I had one nurse holding my hand when I was getting a, my first blood transfusion and she was whispering into my ear and talking to me about writing and work and how important it was and she'd read some stuff of mine. And I just remember that sense of like life flowing back into my body and waking up from it and, and remembering the, the pressure of her hand on mine and how significant that was. Like I said at the beginning, I, I don't think we're in a great age for public acts of grace at the moment. The world just doesn't feel like that we're sort not. of a place at the moment. And if you, I think evidence of that is the, is the proliferation of signs that are going up in supermarkets, in, in hospitals, in any kind of place of public encounter, which thank you for being nice and civil to the staff and or they warn you that rudeness will not be tolerated. <sighs> Yes. That was a post-COVID thing, wasn't it? I was so interested to see that, especially when you start travelling again. And I, I kept asking the people at the in the airports, are people being like, why, where are these signs come from? And you're like, oh, no, they're all just yelling at people all the time. That kind of sense of fear and impatience and impotence. And, yeah, that worries me a lot. And it worries me how distrustful we are of each other and it worries me the silos that social media can create as we all talk about all the time but it is real that kind of feeding into outrage and feeding into hate you don't get a lot of likes for saying oh not no worries mate are you probably were having a bit of a rough day I appreciate that to saying you're an absolute beep 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 and I wish you would go and die. You know, like that literally will probably light up your mentions or whatever it is. So we are literally rewarding ugliness in that way. And that's why I think Grace was so thirsty for that. I really noticed in the response to phosphorescence, in the correspondence I was getting my last mm. book, sorry, which was about awe and wonder and things that sustain you when the world goes dark, there was such good people writing to me about things they were doing and ways they were helping each other and stuff they were doing in their community and how important awe was and how they were hunting out wonder. And I was like, we just don't have very many places to talk to each other about the good. Like when do we have those talks? And that's why I decided to write about Grace, to be able to focus on the good that happens in the world and the remarkable good, the stuff that gives you goosebumps when you see it or you read about it. What is that? When does it happen? Why does it happen? What impact does it have on people around them? And what words do we use for it? I, I wanted to look at that. What's the social research telling you about the connections between that and the epidemic of loneliness? I was interested in the connection between loneliness and wisdom as well, that people who are more lonely were likely to be less wise, on a, like less capable of self-reflection, less capable of seeing another point of view. We've seen research showing that empathy has declined quite markedly in self-reports of university students over a 20-year period and narcissism increasing over the same time. We can always say in history, you're a historian too, Richard, to say it was ever thus. We've always been mad, bawdy, ambitious 
crazy, sometimes feral, sometimes scared, base and yet joyful human beings. But there are times and ways of relating and ways of communicating that can fundamentally shape who we are as well. And I think that we can see that that is happening. And I, I worry a lot about loneliness. My theory on this is that this is happening just as the last people who remember World War II are dying. They remember the consequences. Oh, that's interesting. Of the off-the-leash hatred, right. and the collective hatreds. Right. And stereotyping. And I think that's right, off-the-leash hatreds. Last year I interviewed John Owen from the Wayside Chapel. Yeah. Who's a wonderful man. He told me how he and his wife chose... <laughs> a path of what they called intentional downward mobility, which was to open up their place in the outer burbs to homeless people, drug-addicted people. And that seems to have created all these wonderful small moments and large moments of grace that, I don't know, he's one of the happiest people I ever interviewed, John, and funny and warm and lovely. This seems to me to address the, the question of what you write about, which is the grace that comes from extending love or compassion to people who are really hard to love. Yeah, I remember that interview and I remember how happy I felt after listening to it. And people have said to me, what is the emotion around grace? Like what is grace as an emotion? And I, my response to that fundamentally is, it, is, is comfort. That to me, it comforts me. There are people in the world doing that stuff, not asking for recognition, not asking for awards, who are genuinely trying to love and to show love where it's needed. And again, John doesn't wait at the Wayside Chapel and say, oh, I don't know, mate, show me your CV before I come in and give you a leg up, you know. His door is open. And I think that is profound because now we're trying to shut our doors and build fences and walls and create all kinds of barriers to people we don't know or understand coming in. I think he's a very gracious person in that sense and I think he realises a lot in the way he talks about it that it's just, again, fundamental to being human and but that by looking to the best of a person, by not defining them by the worst thing they've done, then we are providing a kind of hope And we're providing a kind of connection and a kind of community. And I think what is really at danger today are both those things, connection and community. And if we don't understand, someone was reading a book the other day, they were telling me there was, it was about an external threat. So the earth being attacked, a bunch of aliens, something outside and how the earth came together. Like, why is it that we each other are our greatest foes and irritants when we have collectively got so much to do together. And that's why they talk about astronauts going up into space, the overview effect. And the overview effect when you can see over a vast area and they go, these national boundaries don't even matter. The blue marble effect. Where exactly. One, was it Carl Collins, Sagan? Michael Collins and who talked about seeing the Earth as a blue marble from being in orbit around the moon? And that's right. But that, that sense of perspective, which is why people go up into orbit and they're mathematicians and they're usually engineers or they're teachers and they come back as philosophers and poets and theologians because they have seen that the earth has disappeared behind their thumb and then that's why in a fiercely partisan polarized world how are we ever going to get stuff done for our kids for our future generations you write about your late mother who seems to be another one of those people who is capable of extending love and attention and care to unlovable people. Tell me about the relationship she had with a woman who was serving a life sentence in prison named Catherine Knight. Yeah, so mum did a lot of work in prisons and she was also a great believer in grace. She's the one that made me really think about it, like what? It doesn't make sense. She was always talking about huge, uh, remarkable acts of forgiveness. So she was always telling me to just love better people that annoyed me at work. Well, I'd be like, mum... <laughs> You That's annoying to, to hear that. Yeah, I know. you got to understand this person, Mum. I'm like, seriously, like they're undermining me or they're like being a complete cow. And she's like, well, maybe they're just going through blah, blah, blah. I'll be like, oh. <laughs> and maybe right. we are those people too. We could be those we people. people that are annoying to other people. Right. Yes. And what would your mum say? She'd say, oh, just, you know, just try to just give them a bit of love. Yeah. Just think of them. Try to work. I mean, there is wisdom in saying, I wonder what that person's dealing with. 
Sometimes people around us are dealing with significant things that we never really know about, but sometimes people are cows and you need to navigate. Yeah, that's right. And would you, would you say, I, I guess you're not right, Mum, or would you go, Mum, you don't know? I, I would just laugh. No. But she lived this, your mother. She really lived it. And it affected everyone around her so much the way that she lived it. And it was fascinating going to see her in prison. Now, it was also funny because she'd spend the day with someone who did like a massive drug haul into this country, millions of dollars, and she'd be like, oh, I just, I think she was hoodwinked into it by her boyfriend. Or I'd be, she'd talk about someone else who had a beautiful singing voice in the choir and, and I'd go, wait a minute, isn't that the one who decapitated her boyfriend? And she's like, yeah, yeah, but she's got a really good side. And perhaps that's the case. Perhaps this kind of human nature is incredibly complicated. She got to know Catherine Knight, who was responsible for one of the most violent murders that there have been in this country when she had worked in an abattoir. So she skinned her partner and boiled parts of him alive and she was jailed for life. And mum used to speak about this really cheerful, enthusiastic woman who looked after people or looked after other prisoners around the place. And there was one time they were sitting down and they had to talk about things that were weighing on them, things that were bothering them. And mum said, I'm just so busy at the moment and I try to get everything done. And when I'm when I go to sleep at night, I try to pray at night and then I go to sleep and I fall asleep and I just feel so bad because I just can't get my prayers done. Poor mum struggling with her teenagers in a prison work and her counselling. Sorry, and she was stricken with guilt. She was guilty, she, yeah. Because she... Would fall asleep while she was trying to pray. Right. And Catherine said back to her, I think if you're praying to a God, that God would understand your fatigue and would understand the exhaustion and, and what you're dealing with. And Mum was so struck by that as a moment of wisdom. I, I don't know. I, I, I thought about that a lot for a long time. And so for this book I tried to get in touch with with Catherine Knight and I wrote and eventually they passed on an email to her. I was so excited when they did that because I just wanted to know, well, tell me about that moment or that conversation or tell me about my mother and I just got an email back going, she has no recollection of your mother. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, that's interesting because that had a real impact on her so I wonder why or maybe if she saw a photo or maybe... Don't know. Well, there's the truth there, isn't there? Sometimes to deliver grace, you might not give it a second thought afterwards, but the person who receives it never forgets it. Well, that is actually very true. We were talking before about the act of grace being extended as a kind of act of love, particularly how hard it is for the unlovable. And is there any creature more unloved in this world than the parking inspector, Julia? <laughs> and I, I want you to tell me the story of your interaction with the local parking inspector and and what became of that relationship. <laughs> It was my daughter's first day at school and well, a while ago now and I was so excited to pick her up and it says uh, drop off and pick up zone and I was standing next to my car waiting for her to come out and the parking inspector came on and put a ticket on and I was like, wait, but it says drop off and pick up zone and I'm picking her up. And they're like, no, you need to be in your car. Or on your car. And I'm like, but I am, I'm right here. I'm literally three steps away. She said, oh, well, maybe no, no, no. And then she deflected. And I just, and I was then mainly just writing my book. I was making so little money and it slammed me getting this ticket. I was right. like, darn it. That is like full day's wages. Aren't you nice? I'm pretty sure you didn't say darn it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you said something a bit stronger than that. And so so you were furious. I did, was really mad. And and did your anger stay with you? Yeah. I just every time I saw her, I was like, damn it, that's I can't I was standing right next to it. And she should have just said it to me. And it was her first day. And I just and I think we, we had the same parking inspector for a long time there. And then there was one day I was meeting my dad for a coffee actually in a local coffee shop. And then I could see this back of this person in the corner of the cafe just heaving and someone was crying and then someone delivered our coffees. And I was like, what's wrong with the person? They said, I don't know, she's been sitting there crying for ages. So I got up and went and sat down next to her and it was the parking inspector and she said to me, I thought that my son had died. Someone told me he had died and he hasn't. He's just spoken to me but I had two hours 
well, I was looking around online and like, and it was some prank and some stupid thing. I don't know why they did it, but I was looking and I was trying to contact people and she was just reeling with the emotional intensity of that. So I just got her a brownie and we just sat and I just listened to her for a while. It was just a moment of going, okay, that was her fragile day. It's always important to remember just the crap that people around us are going through. Do you think you needed that moment as much, almost as much as she did? Probably. It was just this thing that I'd held on to. But it really alerted me to how those tiny, tiny acts can have a real impact of, you know, connection with strangers because I write a whole section about strangers. And like Nick Cave when he said the first time he went out after the death of his 15-year-old who fell off a cliff, the pain of that... And then he went to a local takeaway store and the woman there recognised him. Of course she knew him, but she didn't say anything. She took his order and at the end when she took the money from him, she just gave his hand a little squeeze. And in that gesture was everything. Podcast and broadcast. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. Find more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. recent Writers Festival, they set up a special booth that provided poetry to people. It was called the Poetry Prescription Booth. Tell mm-hmm. me how that worked. Yeah, that was from the Sydney Story Factory, a wonderful group that runs creative writing classes for kids from like poorly resourced backgrounds and they do great work. They set up this booth and they would ask someone to come up and say what their particular grievance was and they would find a poem, put it in a little bottle and give it to them. So some people would come up and say, my daughter's friend has just found out she's got ovarian cancer or, you know what, I feel like I've got too many opinions in my life. <laughs> I've been told I talk too much, what should I do? <laughs> and they ended up deciding he didn't talk too much but he had problems with his hearing and all these kinds of things. So people came up with a host of laments so from workplace issues to familial dramas and I just thought it was the most beautiful idea to kind of go, you know, words can heal you as well. Words can help. Have you got one of those little poems there? I do. One from B. She says, there are tree branches calling your name. Riverbanks miss your reflection. There is nowhere in the world that considers you foreign. And Pius Adjaman, you can find joy wherever you look, like stroking your thumb against the pleasant texture on the spine of your favourite book. Sometimes it comes down to those little things, the little sensual acts in the moments. And these poets are kids from the story factory. It's really remarkable work. Both of them seem to urge you to look outward. Exactly. You know, there's so much continuation for me on the idea of awe, which I've looked at for a long time. and In phosphorescence, I was talking about the need to deliberately pursue and hunt awe, the importance of feeling small and dwarfed by a larger universe that we all talk so much about the need to project space and authority and power. And But actually, feeling small is incredibly comforting and beautiful sometimes. And there's a man called Dacca Keltner who is like, I call him the godfather of awe. He's done a lot of studies of awe for the last two decades in the University of California. And he did one just recently to try to find out what is the most common experience of awe across 26 countries, almost 3,000 people, different cultures, histories, languages. Is it symphonies? Is it cathedrals? Is it watching the Matildas play? Is it surfing great waves? And what he found was the number one was seeing acts of great decency, kindness, courage in other people. In other words, moral beauty. And I was so struck by that. Sometimes these moments of grace transcend the language barrier. And you've encountered that on your travels around the world. 
some disastrous incidents yes. from your young life. <laughs> yes. There's one particular incident that began with a trip to Spain that began with a disastrous haircut. Can you explain what happened to you, Julia? Oh, yeah. Language barrier and a haircut, not good, especially when you're absorbed in a book at the same time. So what happened when you went to get this haircut? I had just dyed my head bright red and then I was just getting a trim and she trimmed the bottom. Anyway, she lifted up my fringe and said something and I kind of lifted my fingers up and indicated like the tiniest fraction. Right, you only want to cut just little, like... Little trim. Like, like not even a centimetre. That's it. Next thing I knew there were scissors sliding along my scalp <laughs> <laughs> and I lost my fringe and I had this little stubble all sticking up in a row on top of this like red hair. Oh, oh like she thought that was, that was how long you wanted yeah. the entirety of exactly. your fringe. Exactly. She thought that's what you wanted to that's remain it. of your fringe. Yeah, that's it. That's how long I want my fringe to be. So you... <laughs> A little radical tuck. <laughs> A little tuft. So you had dyed red hair and a fringe that was not even a centimetre crowning your, your, yeah. your marvellous forehead. I was a sight. Yeah. I realised I didn't look a treat. All right. But you were going to get on and with I was life. just going to get on with it. Okay. And um, I didn't have many options. Tried to get some headbands. But, yeah, I just looked a bit wrong for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how did things go from bad to worse, though, after that? Well, I knew rom- romantically it was going to be a tough time for a bit. But then... <laughs> then <laughs> Then I got sick with something, who knows. It's like I was just kind of really weak and right. nauseous and and remember the days, Richard, because we're dinosaurs mm. when you used to have to get traveller's checks. Oh, yeah. So I had one small amount of money left to get to the bus to get to a bank to get a traveller's check and then I took the bus in the wrong direction and then I dragged my backpack out and I realised I was sick and I had no money couldn't move anywhere. And, and I didn't just, know where you were. And I had this terrible mm. head of hair. <laughs> I looked like a fool, Richard. And I, so what I did, like any mature young woman would do, was I sat on my backpack and had a big cry. And I just remember this woman coming up to me and she shuffled up to me. She's very old, very thin shawl on. She'd been sitting down the street nearby. She had these penetrating blue eyes and she had these, all these hairs sprouting off her chin and she just patted my head and she was, I don't know what she was saying, I don't know what it was and she was looking into my eyes and I was like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And life's crap sometimes, hey. It was just like the time will pass, we'll all move on. It was kind of this wordless, that well, wasn't the word, sorry, but I couldn't obviously understand, but it was just this beautiful moment of company. This rural Spanish woman came up to you looking like some weird inner city some freak. idiot. Ill and weeping on a backpack and just was kind. Yeah, she was just kind. She might have been saying you're an absolute fool and who did your hair? <laughs> but to me <laughs> it came across as just a moment of kindness. I've never forgotten it. You were in terrible trouble in India on one occasion in Varanasi. Oh, yeah. How did you find yourself in Varanasi to begin with? I had been at a wedding a friend of mine who was Hindu was marrying a Sikh and it was this wild wedding. Lots of dancing, went on for a couple of weeks, lots of saris, lots of carry-on. It was beautiful. But I found myself just wanting to burst out into the rest of India so I just grabbed a little bag and went up to Varanasi. Where there are the ghats, the, the steps ghats. that lead down to the Ganges, which is a, a really sacred uh, site. Sacred. People, yeah. literally it says up at the airport, come here to die because if you die there then you go straight to Nirvana. You miss all the middle bits and people are burnt. There's some people who can't be burnt if you're pregnant or you've been stung by a cobra and sometimes you can see those bodies bobbing along in the river but these were like the ones that burned down at the guts at at night. And I was travelling with someone that I'd, I'd met, just a friend, but I didn't know very well and he went, weird on me one night well the the first night actually we went to the monkey temple and then I I met this girl and we were sitting outside talking and having chai and he found me and he was furious that I'd left him to go and talk to someone else I thought oh no I think this guy's maybe got intent he's so angry that his hands on the back of my of, of my chair just were like the knuckles were white and he was like I'm going I'm out I'm leaving I don't care I was like can you please wait it's quite late And he went, no. The only problem with getting back then is that firstly I was trying to remember where the hotel was, but uh, was getting back was this, they've got really tiny narrow laneways in Varanasi. So the rickshaws can only go so far. So I got dropped off 
towards where the main guts were and it was probably about a kilometre walk to my hotel back along. It was midnight. There were some flames still flickering and there were a few rangy dogs around. I could still feel my heart beating. I just remember counting, just counting to myself, that counting, counting. And there were people calling out to me. You couldn't see them. There were people in the shadows. And then this group of men came up to me and grabbed me and were talking to me. How did they grab you? By my hands, by my arms. And these dogs were, there were two of the dogs around there as well. And they just wouldn't let me go. And I was starting to get extremely worried and I didn't actually know how to get out of this. And then out of nowhere came this guy, one of those holy men, all dressed in white with this staff, a sadhu, and he said something in Hindi to these guys and he got them off me and they dropped my hands. And then he asked me where my hotel was and I still remember because he was he didn't really speak. He, I just still remember him getting me back along that river and he walked me all the way back and I just remember the sound of his staff just going because my heart was beating at the same time so hard. And every now and then he'd still have some group of guys, he'd still have some guys yelling out to him from behind the shadows and he would just keep going. And we got to my hotel and it was all shut and he banged on it with his staff until they let me in. I looked for him every day and I never could find him again to thank him for what he did. And when I was signing out of the hotel, I left the next day. The woman was like, we have a real problem with rape down at the guts at the moment and it's getting a lot worse. I just have so much to thank that guy for. I'll never forget that. You say that while you were writing this book, you been dealing with the recurrent cancer that's been afflicting you over yeah. the last few years. And as a result, you've received these lovely moments of grace from nurses in particular. Yeah. Is there an expectation that you will impart grace? There's this idea that as you sort of veer a bit too close to death, mm. that you will have some wisdom and some oh, insight yeah. to impart to other people. Yeah. I and mean, what do you think of that? I think it's funny because I find the idea that the assumption that if you're sick, then therefore you'll be wise is kind of funny because a lot of people who are sick are still idiots and I'm obviously quite often an idiot. But I do also think that assumption of like, oh, let me just kind of leech some meaning from people who are really suffering. Like why don't we talk to people with chronic pain more about their lessons? Why do you have to be like literally on the... <laughs> on the cliff of your own mortality. So many people living with chronic pain that have to have endurance and resilience around that kind of thing. But then when you go through the literature, there is a reason why we're hungry for those insights, the great regrets of the dying, a lot of those books that have been bestsellers. I was really fascinated to read a, a, a book about by a woman who was a chaplain in an aged care home and the people who spoke to her about their regrets and one of them was not enjoying their bodies more just for being, we're so critical of our bodies all the time for what they can't do or what they look like or don't look like instead of going, this is the body that I have skinny dipped in and made love in and run around in and danced all night in and this is the body that has helped me get through this world. And she also said people regret not dancing more and I kind of love that because it's a good reminder to just dance however foolishly, unselfconsciously as you can. Yeah, well, it's all very well to that. say that, Julia, <laughs> but there are all these prohibitions against people getting older dancing. Like I, I, I held a big party for a friend once and when the 50-somethings started dancing, <laughs> the 20-somethings at the party were so disgusted by the spectacle, they just vacated the room entirely <laughs> and went out the back so they didn't have to look at older people dancing. So and there was, a whole, there was a whole series of YouTube videos about, uh, and I think Triple J encouraged this, <laughs> of filming your dance daggy dad dancing. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? When I talked about that wedding that I was at in India, one of the amazing things was on that dance floor, there are the grandmas, the aunts, the uncles, the family, and it's so joyful. Don't let the 20-somethings shame you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, trust me, I get it. My daughter sends me TikToks of like old people dancing and it's meant to be me, but, you know, <laughs> I shall persist. Nevertheless, she persisted. <laughs> <laughs> 
when people talk to me about, oh, no, my next birthday, oh, no, I can't possibly say what I am. I'm like, what? You're getting older. Like, that's awesome. Like, I fundamentally have a different approach to that. I feel like every year is a triumph. Let's come back to the idea of forgiveness. Grace is often seen in the act of forgiveness. It sort of can liberate the person who forgives and it might certainly help the person who is forgiven from it. But what about justice? Like there's grace in justice as mm, well. Mm -hmm. Can there be grace in the act of forgiveness without justice, without atonement? I think that it's extremely important. I think the problem is forgiveness means exactly that, letting people off the hook and it's all fine and that in itself creates a culture of impunity because you can just ask people to forgive. And if you look at history, culturally, who have we forgiven? <laughs> the powerful, the male, the acts of violence, domestic violence, sexual violence. We've all just considered these are things to be forgiven or to be quietly, silently absorbed. And so I don't agree with that. I think you can still go through an act of unburdening. I think that's a really useful way to think about forgiveness. If you talk to a lot of survivors of sexual assault, they'll talk about there's often a pressure on them very quickly to forgive. I think that's very difficult in a culture when there haven't necessarily been consequences for the violence. So I think that's incredibly fraught and I really, really wrestled with it. But I do see that when it happens, like, for example, with restorative justice. Where you have a victim of a crime confronts yep. the transgressor or the, the perpetrator, if you like, in a mediated session. Exactly. And the mediated thing is really the important part because they do so much work, sometimes like several months or a year in preparing and making sure that there's remorse, that they're ready to have that conversation and that there'll be something in it. It's very victim driven because a lot of victims go through the courts and come out feeling worse or feeling like they didn't even make a statement about what happened to them or they've never actually said to this person, this is what you did. Because and the court process is fundamentally about law. Yeah. But restorative justice is fundamentally about harm, isn't it? Yeah, that's a really good point. The and the future, that. the law will be looking at what's happened in the past and restorative justice will be looking at how do you then go on with that burden of what someone's done to you. It actually gives people a chance, at not, if not redemption, to turn around or to listen to someone they've harmed and to try to be better and do better. I think that's a gift as well. I spoke to a woman called Debbie McGrath who, when she was 24 years old, heavily pregnant, got a phone call in the middle of the night. And it was her father saying that her brother had been killed. He was 20 and he'd been shot by one of his best friends. And Debbie found that that moment, from that moment on, and that guy went off and went to prison, never gave a reason for it, has never give a reason, given a reason for why he did that. She became so consumed with rage and resentment, with fury, with murderous thoughts. She told me that she would be watching sunsets and thinking about how she could murder this guy, that it affected her health. She put on a lot of weight. She got diabetes. She had other health issues, her father too, and it really kind of had a very terrible impact on the family. She eventually sat down with him in one of these sessions and she said to him, this is what you did to me. This is what you did to my father and laid out all of the health consequences. This is what you did to the son of my brother. He never had a father. And she said that during that session, she literally sat up and looked behind her because she felt like a, an actual weight had been lifted from her. She felt that she then, with everything that she had gone through, she felt like she was putting it, her suitcase at his feet because it was his stuff and she walked away unburdened by it and she said it has changed her life. And the fundamental thing that she's been able to do, she was worried she wouldn't be able to love again. She was worried she wouldn't be able to love her grandchildren because for her love meant loss and pain and she came out of it and she said, I can now love again. And you speak to practitioners of restorative justice who can say there is a moment when you can either recognise each other's humanity or there's, and sometimes it's not even 
you wouldn't even use the word forgiveness. Maybe forgiveness sometimes isn't verbal. Sometimes it's the end of it. It's a nod and a recognition or a, you know, it can be a glance or a look or there's a, there's a moment where you see better and that can change your life. The word grace is often associated with religion, particularly with Christianity. Mm. One thing you haven't written about, and this surprised me, is mm. the connection grace has with a sense of sacredness, sen- yeah. apprehension of sacredness. Yeah. I do think that there is awe in the sacred and I think there's mystery in the sacred. Forgiveness is intrinsic to most religions. Grace is in- integral to Christianity in that sense of it's not deserved. You're not does what you're being forgiven for your sins is not deserved, and that's a grace that comes from God. But it's a grace that's also freely available. I think that what you're talking about with the sacred is that ineffable, and it is another form of awe. I think the sacred is also in what is that sense when you sit under a canopy of stars and you feel small, but yet also comf- comforted. And I think that a lot of the designers of some of our most spectacular cathedrals have, with their soaring arches, have recognised that and how it can feel to be really tiny at the foot of something so immensely beautiful. You live near the water. Yes. You swim all the time. Yes. As best you can. In fact, I think you say you you kind of need the ocean to keep yep. your spirit to buoy your spirits up. Yes. After the most recent bout of surgery, you couldn't go in the water for a while for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. What was it like to then, eventually, be able to get back in? Get back in. I thought with my last surgery, I wouldn't be able to swim again. My doctor had said that to me. You've got to prepare yourself for it because I might need a feeding system that would need a portal that I couldn't play with so as I couldn't access and deaccess and like I was saying to her before if there's just one instruction you know have to tell your surgeon if you're making a whole series of decisions go please I I want to be able to swim or I want some I want to be kind watertight of, oh, yeah I know <laughs> exactly watertight but I just had to prepare myself for it and I just thought I just have to muck around on boats or like try to work out another way to be near the water but the first thing when I came to and I was in ICU and you're like beep, beep and your eyes are hazy and you're trying to go, wait, have I made it through? What's happened? What's going on? I remember turning to my brother who was sitting opposite me and his chin was on his hands and he went, Jules, you can swim. So getting in was so good. And it was kind of a bit of an effort to get in the water. But I think the first time I went in, I saw a cuttlefish. I was with my friend Jock. And um, the world came alive. I was so happy. So, yeah, the ocean is pure joy and sustenance for me, like millions of people. It's a place to heal. And like the song says, the best things in life are free. It's true. (laughs) Great to speak to you again, Julia. Thank you. Such a pleasure. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations.